In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, now that we finish our discussion about the three qualities of prayer, I want to talk about the perfect prayer of the Blessed Virgin Mary and to use this as a way of illustrating these three qualities in Our Lady, how she prayed perfectly, perfectly and uh, perfectly dev devoutly, fittingly and attentively. To do this, we will look at two paintings one that shows her contemplative life, one that shows her active life. And we will see these three qualities in each of the paintings. So let's begin then. This first painting is from the 15th century painter, Blessed Fra Angelico, one of the greatest and most devout painters in all of church history. This is one of his Annunciations. We see firstly how devoutly the Blessed Virgin Mary is praying. Her prayer flowed from her Immaculate Heart, that is, a heart free from all sin, a heart that naturally gives itself to God ever more and more and more. Remember, devotion is a giving of oneself completely to God in the prayer. The Blessed Virgin Mary ever gave herself more and more to God. Now we can't see the heart itself, but the environment in this painting is actually a certain imitation of her heart. See that she's in a garden area to the left of the painting. This teaches us that Mary's soul is a paradise, an immaculate paradise. Her womb was a paradise for Jesus for nine months. And this is what St. Louis de Montfort says. He compares Jesus to the new Adam who took his delight in the paradise of Mary. Again, that garden represents this concept called ortus conclusus, which in Latin means a garden enclosed. And this is a classical way of showing forth the virginity of Our Lady, that she was a garden enclosed, a fountain sealed up, as it says in the Canticle of Canticles. Again, let's see the symmetry of those, uh, of those pillars. And this reminds us of her soul, how everything, all the virtues in her soul were so ordered, all ordered around this one virtue of divine charity. Finally, look at the lack of things in this painting. There's no decorations in this room, no furniture. It's very plain. This shows the detachment of the Blessed Virgin Mary and her simplicity of soul. She was not attached to earthly things or to people, but she was attached to God alone. Secondly, we see her praying fittingly. Look at her, reverently seated, humble, modest. See the queenly aspects of her, which are very subtly put in there. She's wearing that royal blue. She's sitting on a little makeshift throne. You see the halo, halo around her head. These very queenly aspects of her. This is quite a different portrayal of her than the previous Annunciation that Fra Angelico painted, or one of the two previous ones. Finally, we see her praying 
attentively in this silence. This is primarily seen in the beautiful face. We see here looking very, very attentively at the Archangel Gabriel because she's considering the word of God spoken through this angel. Luke's narrative of the Annunciation shows us how attentive the Virgin was, how thoughtful she was. Because when the angel said, Hail, full of grace, she was troubled. She wondered what sort of manner this saying was. It troubled her humility especially. And then when she was told that she would bear a son, she was said, How could this be done because I know not man? She was attentive and thoughtful. But she was also submissive to God's word because in the end she said, Be it done unto behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. This second painting is my personal favorite. It's by Joseph von Furich, a 19th century painter and it is called Mary Ascends the Mountain. It is one of my favorites because it's one of the few paintings of Our Lady doing something active. We usually see her sitting with Our Lord in her hands in a very contemplative state, but this painting shows her in her active and apostolic life. Our Lady did many, many active works throughout her life, and she did them all prayerfully as should we. First of all, we see her praying devoutly in this scene. Now, as in the other scene, we cannot see her heart, but it is revealed in the, by the environment, namely by those angels that encompass her. The angels are uh, offering incense, They're singing Gregorian chant. They're throwing flowers on her. Now all of her devotion in this flows from one thing in the end. That is Jesus in her womb. Our Lady was a living tabernacle for those nine months before our Lord's birth. And surely she lived all of it in the most intense and prayerful state, knowing that God was in her womb. We look at her and wonder, what is she thinking? What is she praying? What deep things is she speaking to her God, who himself who himself is physically dwelling within her? Now we priests are blessed because we get to share in this in a certain way. That is, when we give communion to people, when we do sick calls and bring communion to people, we get to drive around with the Eucharist around our necks, and we're really imitating Our Lady. I saw this that especially this year, and I didn't realize this until afterwards, but this year on the Feast of the Visitation of Our Lady, and this is what this painting is portraying, the Visitation, I happened to be doing communion calls to a few families. And even more, I happened to go to the Hills District. I spent most of my time in the Hills District giving communion to families. And this very much relates to what Our Lady did because the Gospel tells us that Our Lady went with haste into the hill country. So I was very happy to have imitated Our Lady on the Feast of the Visitation this year. Now, if we are in the state of grace, God is in our soul, and we can imitate her to that extent, that whatever we do, whatever works we have to undertake, we can keep uh, keep in mind that presence of God in our soul, and have those moments where we enter into our hearts and speak to God who's present in them. Secondly, see how fittingly Our Lady is praying. She's fit for a journey. She has the shoes, she has the staff, but that does not hinder her prayer. She could pray anywhere. Her whole life was a prayer. 
Thirdly, see how attentively she prays. She's in the beautiful countryside, but she's not looking around up and down at it. She seems to be oblivious to the angels. Rather, she's focused on God. She's also focused on that charitable errand that she wants uh, for her cousin Elizabeth. So she's focused on love of God and love of neighbor. That's her inspiration, that's her drive, not the countryside. Yet, Our Lady, although she's focused on God completely, she's it doesn't hinder her from doing the things that she needs to do. That is, she's not going to trip because if you look closely, she's very skillful in placing her staff on that rock over the spring. She knows how to place every single one of her steps in a safe manner. And finally, we must say a word of Saint Joseph uh, in this painting. He's portrayed as very submissive and in a very humble position towards Our Lady, picking up that flower that the angels dropped over her. And this shows that he loved to serve Our Lady. He was her, her protector. So we ask, ending this little meditation, Blessed Virgin Mary, teach us to pray well. If a mother has a special power to teach her children to pray, then what power must you have over us in this regard? So that's all for today. Next time I hope to start to speak about the kinds of prayer. Let's finish with a glory be in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as he was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without an Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.